good day subscribers welcome into today's video got a good amount to talk about here today going to talk about obviously what's going on in the market uh yeah wall street's sending us a little signal here we got to talk about cpi and uh some things that are working against us for this upcoming cpi number that's less than 48 hours and kind of what to expect from that uh i did buy some stocks today i'm going to share obviously what stocks those were and kind of how i think about deploying capital into the market which i think is an important subject because everybody always see, obviously has a finite amount of money and it's kind of like when when's the right time to deploy in stocks versus is, um, you know, stay back and keep cash and things like that. And I'll kind of give you my perspective on that. So first off here, um, wow. Yeah, I mean, the market's kind of been um, on the DL you know, coming back a bit. This is just over the past few weeks. The NASDAQ uh, bottomed out intraday one day at like 10.5 range. And, um, you know, we've climbed up to like 11.6, right? And yeah, it was, it was, it was all looking as good. And then Wall Street said, uh, you think you're the captain? I'm the captain now, okay? And uh, yeah, today, uh, not so, no bueno out there. And Shopify, ugh, I think everybody should have Shopify on their watch list. The reason being, even if you don't never plan to buy the stock or short the stock or anything, I think Shopify, like literally it's as simple as this. Whatever watch list you have, you open up the Shopify app or website or whatever, right? And if Shopify is down 8%, you know the market's awful. If Shopify is up 8%, you know the market's great. I mean, pretty much every day I see the stock make an 8% move. It's like 8% up, 8% down, 8% up, 8% down. And uh, no different here today with uh, Shopify. Good old Tesla, my ass, a pretty big move down here today, about 6%. Uh, you know, Tesla lost about $50 per share here today. Um, not a small number, not a small number at all. And, you know, I think, I think because the market has been in the state where, you know, you see these massive companies moving around, you know, 5%, 8%, I think it's almost led us to believe um, like this is normal. And what I can tell you is this, this is not normal. This is not normal for, uh, you know, a $700 billion market cap, like good old Tesla, my Tesla, to move around uh, 6% up down up down like on, on a daily basis but that's the market we're in and you go through these these time periods when especially when you're in a bear market you're in a crashing market where you know it's it's woof. i mean the the vix doesn't show really how volatile the market is but when you see these sorts of moves it, it starts to kind of make sense like oh my gosh like this is not normal this is you know six percent and six percent like holy smokes and these are huge market caps and it's not just i mean look at all these other big techs look at uber today five percent netflix five percent meta four and a half percent today nvidia four percent paypal almost four percent uh amazon amd google like three percent moves there you know big moves for these stocks kind of day after day after day which just shows you you know, like I said, the VIX is one thing to look at, and I think it's important, but I think the market's much more volatile than the VIX is giving it right now. Let's just put it that way, because yeah, these big these big companies, I mean, small caps, you can understand if they're moving 4%, 6%, 8% a day, but I mean, these are huge companies, like tens of billions of dollars of market cap, and in some situations, hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap, and they're just flying all around, up, down, up, down, up, down, right? Banking gave us a signal here today, in my opinion. Um, if you didn't know, the big banks are basically all going to be reporting earnings pretty much over like the next five trading days. And some of these over the next few trading days, JP Morgan's in just a few days from now. And it, you know, it almost seems like, you know, these didn't make a big move at all today. It, I mean, it almost feels like Wall Street is, is, doesn't really think there's a much downside in these ones. So they feel like they don't need to necessarily um, position out of those. And I'm going to show you guys something in a moment so you can kind of understand like how Wall Street's kind of thinking about these things, right? Because I think that's uh, obviously kind of an important issue. If you look at the fintechs here today, SoFi down 3.7%, PayPal down over 4%, Square down almost 6%, The Hood down about 8%, Affirm down 8%, and Coin just can't get out of its own way. That one down about 11% here today. Man, it's going to be interesting. If we ever get another big Bitcoin sell-off, you know, who knows, maybe we already reached the bottom on Bitcoin and maybe we got a lot further to fall when it comes to Bitcoin. It's going to be interesting just to see like what happens with coin stock price. Cause I mean, it's $50 stock now. I mean, if Bitcoin goes down to 15,000 to 10,000, let's say hypothetically, what does it mean for coin stock? Are we talking about this as a $25 stock? And then at that point in time, like, holy smokes, does the company get to a position where they have more in cash in cash equivalents than they actually do in market capitalization of the entire company. I mean, you never know. It's a possibility. We've seen that actually play out recently with Hood, where literally the, the company dropped to uh, essentially the market cap is, is lower than the cash uh, recently as of a few weeks ago. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. Now, I think pulling up a heat map is kind of important on a, on a big downer day like today, because you get to understand if like what's going on in the market, right? And I think the first thing to understand about the market before I kind of get into this is 
you, you have a few different groups of, of folks in the market, right? You have the long-term investors, which are people that are obviously, you know, buying a stock for the next three years, five years, 10 years, whatever, right? And they're thinking about multi-years down the road, and I got to buy these stocks. And so that's a, that's a group of folks in the market, right? You obviously have, uh, you know, uh, the, the pension funds that are in the market. You obviously have, like, uh, you know, the, the, the folks that are not buying individual stocks, but they're buying, like, into index funds and things like that, right? And so that's a group. That's a whole group. We'll just call them the longer-term folks, right? Then you have what actually dictates the stock market, at least in the short term, is not that group I just spoke to you about there. What dictates the stock market in the short term is actively managed funds. So think about hedge funds. Think about actively managed ETFs. Um, and honestly, the machines, the the algorithms, right? Algorith al algorithmic trading is massive in the market. I mean, most trading that's done now is um, by, done, not done by humans anymore at this point in time. So if you're talking about what's going to move the market in the short term, it's not, it's not that, that long-term group. It's these short-term folks that are trying to position in and out of stocks, right? And it's the hedge fund manager that says, I got to sell off, you know, $50 million of stocks over here so I can put that $50 million into cash because I think, you know, there's, there's potential downside this week or I've got to hedge some position so I got to buy, you know, a bunch of put options over here, right? That's... That's who's kind of that's who's moving the market in the short term. It's not the long term investor who comes in and says, "I'm going to scoop up some shares in this situation," right? And so, if you look at a heat map today, this shows us very clearly what these folks are actually doing with their money. And the truth is, they're not selling out to go put that money necessarily in other sectors. The only two that did halfway decent today were utilities and uh, you know a little bit of defensive, but they weren't even up very big at all, right? And so, what this shows me here today is. Folks were, and when I say folks, I'm talking about hedge funds, big money, Wall Street money. They were selling some of these stocks and they're putting that money either into cash because it's a risky week. They look at that, right? Or they're, they're, you know, using that money to short or they're using that money to buy puts or something like that, right? But they're clearly not rotating. Like sometimes you can look at a heat map and it's like, you know, you might see red, 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 but then you might see green in healthcare. You might see green in energy and, and just, you know, a lot of big upward moves. Green in industrials, things like that. Green in healthcare. But that's just not obviously what happened here today. The money's not rotating. The money's either going to cash or it's going to short or it's going to hedge and, and buy puts and things like that, okay? So I think that's just important. Now, CPI numbers. So you know, less than 48 hours from now, we're going to have the new CPI numbers out, which is, you know, it's just massive for the entire market. And this is the thing that's going to move. And I want to go through specific numbers if we hit those, like what that means for the stock market and things like that. Obviously, last month came in at 8.6. Food's gone insane. Energy's gone insane. Basically, just about everything's gone insane. That's why you come in with an 8.6 number, which is obviously extremely high, right? Now, Oh boy. Okay. Here, here's a deal with the numbers. All right. And, and oh, before I get into that, this is very important. If you think about June numbers, which are the numbers that are about to be reported, the biggest downside I see is the fact that gas prices went to record levels, like literally record levels during the month of June, you know, halfway through the month of June, we'd never seen gas prices that, that, that up there. So nonetheless, energy is going to be off the charts high. And so that's likely going to push CPI to pretty darn high numbers. And it's likely going to be, a, you know, a pretty ugly CPI number again, because in all, honestly, all, everything else didn't magically come down. Food didn't come magically come down in price. Uh, rents didn't magically come down in price. So July numbers are shaping up to maybe potentially be a little better. And the reason being is obviously you've seen, uh, you know, oil prices started to decline over the past month or so. And that's good. Obviously, we're starting to get some real weakness in real estate. I probably should do a full, like, blown, like, real estate video because I was actually just looking at a bunch of numbers and data and stuff around real estate. I think it's very important. Just kind of understand there. So July could be looking a lot better for CPI, but this June number could definitely be ugly. And one of the big reasons is, honestly, energy price just went absolutely insane during the month of June, right? Now, let's talk about some what-if numbers here for CPI. And if it comes in at this number, kind of what are we looking at here, okay? So here's the deal. If we come in lower than 8%, which is probably not happening. I would put it at like, I don't know, maybe a 10% probability. It's a very low probability we come in less than 8%, although it wouldn't be necessarily a bad thing. That would be a great thing for the market. The market would likely have a huge rally because if we came in at lower than 8% number, a lot of people would be, that would be a situation where a lot of people would be very, very confident. July's number would be uh, 
coming in substantially below that number, right? Because obviously energy has gotten much cheaper over the past month than it was obviously during the month of June. So that would be a situation where the market rallies hard. And there would be a situation where everybody feels a lot more comfortable about the Fed potentially not being as aggressive, okay? Now, if we, this is what I think most people are expecting in the market, somewhere between an 8% and 8.9% number. If we come in anywhere in there, I don't expect the market to move up or down in any meaningful way. Because that's kind of, if we come in at another 8.6 or an 8.4 or an 8.8 or something like that, that's kind of one of those situations where folks are going to look at it and they're like, you know, when I say folks, once again, this is the big short-term money, the algorithms and obviously the hedge funds and actively managed funds and things like that. They'll look at that and they'll be like, okay, we don't really have enough to go off of here. We don't have enough to say, okay, inflation's out of control going, it's going to go much higher. We, are, we don't have, a, you know, anything to say, you know, these numbers are going to get much better in the short term either. So that would be a, what I call no man's land for the market. And that would be a situation where we don't get much movement in the market. Now, now, if we're in the nines, let's say nine to nine point nine percent, that's a flapjacks fall on the floor situation. Uh, that you know definitely expect to move down in the market if we came in at nine point something, because that would show a clear indication that inflation is still going much higher. The Fed's likely going to have to still be very very aggressive. Now, the end of the world number I call it is ten percent plus. Okay. If for any reason we came at 10% plus, I mean, there's going to be no more flapjacks for a couple of weeks, okay? Uh, yeah, that would be ugly. Now, the interesting thing that would happen if we came in at 10% plus is not just a sell-off in the market. The interesting thing that would happen is VIX would spike up super high because people would panic. People would absolutely freak out, okay? Because if you start talking about 10% plus, you start, you start going from, oh, we got high inflation to then you start talking about hyperinflation. If we came in a 10% plus number, the Fed likely would raise almost immediately at least 100 basis points, if not 200 basis points, almost immediately if that situation played out, okay? Let's hope that doesn't play out because, you, know, like, you know, unless you're looking to buy stocks, you can get them a lot cheaper. So if maybe you're hoping for like a 10, 10.5% 10 number. But I can tell you that would be a situation where the entire financial markets would become a disaster. Stocks would sell off huge. Bitcoin would likely tank to, I don't know, 15K or something like that. Ethereum would be down to 700 bucks. Like there would be a scenario where everything sold off very heavy and we got a massive move down because yeah the fed would just have to be in a situation where their backs against the wall and they have to raise immediately essentially and then also if we came in at 10 percent plus you know the fed already has credibility issues okay they already have credit so if if we came at 10 percent plus oh my gosh man everybody's going to be out for them and you know th then even they're going to start talking about j Powell needs to step down like the whole the whole the whole talk in conversation moves very differently if you ever came in a 10% plus number, right? And so we'll see what happens with all that. But that's kind of what to expect from the market if those situations do play out there. And like I said, the VIX, the VIX would spike very high. And, and in order for the VIX to spike high, and we usually see that throughout every crash, and we haven't really seen VIX go insane like to a 40 plus, you know, it, it obviously spiked very high when Russia invaded Ukraine. That was a big moment for the VIX. But we haven't really seen an epic moment like you saw in 2020, right? Or like you saw in the 2008, 2009 crash where VIX spiked, you know, insanely high a few times, you know, 40 plus. And the reason being is we haven't had necessarily an event outside of the Russia-Ukraine event where it caused mass panic in the market, right? And so it's just been a grind down for the market for like the last eight months, right? A painful grind down. But you haven't had everybody panic. You have to have a capitulation type event to get panic in the market. If we came in at 10% plus for, for CPI, then we're talking about we're in a panic situation, right? And that's when you could be looking at this, yeah, that you know 40 plus VIX that just goes through the roof. And yeah, we'll see what happens with all that. But um, you know that would honestly give some comfort actually to the market. I will say that. Okay. Now, as far as me today, I was out there buying some stocks. I bought some PayPal here today. I bought some Chef here today, and I bought some Meta here today. Obviously, a lot of big discounts in the market. And I want to just spend a moment kind of talking about how I think about spending capital out there in the market versus like holding some back and things like that. So, obviously, you know, if, if their stocks are discounted, I'm going to take advantage of some deals out there. But on the flip side, got to hold a little bit of cash around right now. And the reason being is CPI numbers are coming out, right? And so, you know, if we get a bad number, the market's going to tank more and you, you want to be in a position to at least take advantage of those deals, right? The other thing we have going on is earnings season's just starting. They're just shooting the gun. They're just starting the race now. Okay, the race is just starting. Earnings season's here. 
And so we got to get through the bank earnings. Then after that, we got to get through a lot of the big industrials. Then we got to get through big tech, Apple, Microsoft, Google, McDougal, Amazing Zon, you know, Tesla, Maesla. What, what are their EPS numbers looking like, right? Um, I mean, we got to get through all those big dogs, NVIDIA, AMD. We got to get through all those companies. They all got to report earnings, right? Meta. So you know, we're going to have to see, like, those are going to be what ultimately moves the market. And so if there's any major moves down there, it's going to move the entire market down. So you've got to have some capital around to take advantage of some of those deals if we, if they are presented, right? And then obviously, if you own any mid caps and small caps, they're all going to be usually reporting after the big dogs do it, right? And so we're in the situation where the market's going to be kind of epic and crazy for the next 30 days, the next 30 trading days, I really mean. The next 30 trading days are going to be crazy in the market. So you've got to have at least a little bit of capital around. You want to take advantage of some deals if you get them out there in the market and some stocks that you love for the long term. But at the same time, you've got to keep a little bit of capital around just in case because, I mean, there's, it's going to be messy. And, you know, if you own, let's say you've got a portfolio of, um, you know, 10 stocks. Uh, there's a high probability at least one of those stocks, if not several of those 10 stocks, are not going to report good earnings and are going to drop. And if you don't have any capital around, you can't buy the dip in those, right? Also, if you're looking at some other stocks in the market that you think are really good deals right now, it, there's a good possibility some of those could report disappointing earnings and could fall on earnings, right? And so you got to have some capital around to take advantage of those deals as well. It, you know, it's not a, it's not a very fun feeling in the market if you're going into earnings season and you understand like there's a high probability some of your stocks are going to drop and you're not going to be able to take advantage of those deals, right? And so that's why it always pays to have a little bit of cash around. And obviously you want to deploy as you see deals in the market, but you got to have something around because we're going into earnings season, man. And uh, yeah, it's going to be wild. So anyways, guys, much love as always. I think I'm going to do a real estate video later tonight. There's, all, there's a lot of new data I just was looking at that just came out here around real estate that I think is very important to look at. So I'm going to likely make a video kind of going over all those numbers and, and kind of the information that's going on there. So much love as always, guys. I appreciate you joining me. Also, if you didn't already know, I actually made a couple courses free right now. One's kind of a little more of a beginner course. The other one's a little more of an advanced course um, than that one. And so if you want access to those, uh, you can basically check out the pinned comment down there, get on a call and uh, somebody from my team will get you enrolled in whatever one's kind of the best fit for you. You don't have to buy anything. You don't have to join the private stock group uh, to get access to that and uh, take advantage. And uh, yeah, anyways, guys, much love as always and have a great day.